All right, good afternoon. Uh, before we get started, I definitely want to take some time to thank the volunteers, the organizers, everyone working here, and to all of you for coming to listen to and talk about the most riveting topic here on the calendar, data privacy and security. I'm very excited to be here. So let's, let's go. Let's go. So about me a little bit, my name is Ronnie Burt. I live in Austin, Texas. I have been using WordPress for about 10 years in different ways. Uh, for the last eight years, I work, I've been working for a company called InkSub. In InkSub, we have several different services, WPMU Dev, uh, Campus Press, and Edublogs. I'm the general manager of our enterprise and uh, education services. And I had the lucky honor of being chosen to lead all of our recent GDPR regulation and compliance stuff. So I got to learn about all of this great stuff, uh, a little bit about what we'll talk about today. Um, before I got into the WordPress thing, I was a middle school and high school math teacher. And so I will also be very offended if you are not talking, raising your hand, asking to go to the bathroom, and all that sort of good stuff. Uh, it's just what I'm used to with my 12 and 13 year old students. So, yes? Excuse me, but what does Crazy Mother Hacker mean? Ah, you'll just have to keep following along and see what happens. <laughs> so, who's this talk for? So, if you'll indulge me just for a minute, if you can give a round of applause, clap your hands, if you have a WordPress site and you do not have a privacy policy on that site that you know about. Well, round of applause. Don't be embarrassed. Yes, no privacy policy. All right, uh, clap your hands, a round of applause if you have a privacy policy, but you haven't read it, looked at it, or updated in six months or more. Probably some of you there. Yeah, good. And then also, if you collect any sort of data, the minute type of data on a WordPress site, and you haven't asked for consent from the visitor about that data, you may not want to admit this publicly, but let's clap our hands a little bit. So any of you that clapped, or those that should have clapped, uh, but didn't, this talk is definitely for you. And so I know it's not the most exciting topic, but we're going to try to be laid back. Uh, you can interrupt me if you want, but there'll be time for questions at the end. And I should have mentioned, um, my Twitter handle was on the first slide. It's at Ronnie Burt. I put a link to the slides and also to a checklist that I'll talk about at the end there on Twitter and make sure that you have access to, to the slides. The slides also contain some notes and some extra details, more than what you'll see on the slides themselves. So first, I want to bust a myth here uh, that you can use a plugin for compliance. So there's some parts to this that we really have to talk about. A plugin, WordPress core, all this sort of good stuff is not going to be enough. There's no like easy, uh, you know, hit this red button and it's going to fix it for you. Um, and then compliance is also kind of a word that people are trying to have take on a different meaning than what it really should be where compliance is really just about a point in time that you meet some set of standards, where our data privacy practices and our security practices are really more about a long term from the beginning to the end and ongoing what it is that we're doing. So if someone's telling you that you're compliant or they are compliant, um, I get asked all the time with our enterprise and education customers to verify compliance, and that makes me really uncomfortable. Yes, I can show some sort of certification, and we can talk about a snapshot within a given point of time, but, and I understand the needs of why they're always asking for these things, but really, our data practices are so much more than that. They should be evaluated um, in, in many different ways, more than that as well. So why should you care about data privacy security practices? Well, first of all, it's the law. And actually here in Massachusetts was uh, the first, I believe, um, data privacy specific law in the modern age in the internet times back in 2010 um, that companies here with customers in Massachusetts have had to have been following. Um, that law really was about the most basic and obvious levels of personal information, your name, social security numbers, and things like that, but really got the ball rolling. You've also probably heard of the general data protection regulation in the European Union. You probably got like all of us, a million emails in the month of May asking to read the updated terms and conditions and services and privacy policies of all these companies around the world. Um, 
Just last month, the end of last month, California legislature passed a law and the governor signed that goes into effect on January 1st, 2020 of the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is very much, in a lot of ways, modeled after the GDPR. Um, one thing for most of us that will make this not as big of a deal is that the California law, as of now, only applies to companies making more than $25 million in revenue um, from California residents or with 50,000 customers. So most of us probably won't have to worry about it too much technically, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be aware of what's going on. And also, in state capitals, world capitals, all over the, you know, everywhere, this is a topic. It's in the news, it's what's going on, and so we just need to be prepared. So uh, there's some differences in philosophy between the U.S. or us. I couldn't determine if it should be us, like uppercase, lowercase s, or U.S., so I left it, uh, versus the world. And um, one of those is just around the way that these regulations are enforced. So in the U.S., we're very lawsuit happy. Everything happens in the civil courts. Um, so even in the new California law, the way it's designed is that it just makes it easier for the consumers to sue the companies. Um, so they still have to go through that whole process, basically ask permission to sue and all sorts of things. Where in the EU and in most of the world, the philosophy is more that the government slaps a fine, takes money directly from companies, shuts them down, all sorts of things like that. So here, things get caught up in the courts forever, and you might get uh, class action lawsuits and things like that. There's a target class action lawsuit that I'll reference maybe a few times been going on for like five years. Someday we might get seven bucks check in the mail or something each, who knows. <laughs> and when it comes to this, I'm not really gonna talk specifically about any of these uh, laws so much as <coughs> just general best practices and keeping in mind a risk-based approach. So what that means is you have to know your risk, know how big of a deal it is to you based on the type of data that you're collecting or the type of site that you're running and managing. What is important to me or what works for me and what regulations I need to follow might be different than you and your site. So it's really hard to be very specific, but there are some general practices that we can definitely follow that are gonna get us there. So, one of those uh, things that, that if you are in the privacy data world at all, uh, kind of the phrase that you'll hear is privacy by design. And privacy by design has been around for a while, I think since the mid-90s. Um, I think it was Canadian uh, data authorities started putting together this list and it has since been kind of adopted and rolled into everything from the GDPR, countries around the world are modeling basically their laws, their regulations based on this concept of privacy by design. And I could have a whole session on privacy by design, and you know it, it might be interesting. Um, in fact, on WordPress TV, there's one from WordCamp Europe that, or no, is from uh, WordCamp Dublin by Heather Burns that you can just Google on WordPress TV. WordPress TV and Heather Burns, I think, is one of the top that comes up, where she goes into great detail on each one of these principles. But in general, there are seven principles in the privacy by design construct, and that is that. Everything you do, it needs to be proactive, not reactive. So we need to anticipate the issues before they reach the user and be preventative. They need to be a default setting. Consent from a user is not assumed, they need to opt in. They need to be embedded into the design, so it's not something on top of, it needs to be part of the site, part of the flow, whatever it is that we're building. It needs to be a positive sum, so we can't remove um, Functionality, we can't, we can't go backwards and, and take away consent. That one's a little hard for me to explain without going into great detail, so we can, we can look into that. It needs to be end-to-end -end from the very beginning uh, before you start building the site and you're wireframing it out through building it, through pub, uh, putting it live on the web, and then ongoing and reviews and any future iterations. It needs to be constant. And then also, um, at every point that the data travels or that the data is exists needs to be protected end to end. It needs to be, there needs to be visibility and transparency. So we need to be able to talk about um, publicly basically what it is that we're doing in our practices and uh, be very open and transparent with whoever it is that we're, we're collecting data on. 
and it needs to respect the user, it needs to be user-centric with choices. So those are the seven principles, and like I said, we can go into great, great detail on those principles, but it's, uh, it's always important for me as I was kind of framing this, uh, these slides and everything, and was it framed as our process of rewriting our privacy policy as a company, that we go back to these seven principles and make sure that we're hitting them all and that, that they all make sense. So what's personal? What's personal data? Uh, you might hear it called PII, personally identifiable information. And there are the traditional ones that I was talking about, the usual suspects, the usual identifiers, your name, your social security number, your driver's license number, your address. Those we all understand are personal. The rest on the list, um, these are from the new California law and to various degrees are involved and are, are listed in the GDPR and other laws and frameworks. Um, and a lot of what's PII, which is very frustrating for those of us that are trying to um, meet the, you know, what these laws are trying to tell us to do, is that they're decided in case law and, and after the fact. It's not really prescribed from the beginning. So we're still kind of figuring some of this out, but it's important to kind of think about. So geolocation data. If uh, you're collecting data from where your site visitors are coming from, can be considered personal information. If uh, any biometric data, our websites are probably not to the point, I don't know if there's a Gutenberg block yet about like <laughs> fingerprint scanning and, and that sort of stuff, but anything that's biometric data would definitely be personal. Your browsing history is one that's specifically listed in the California law and is also um, targeted in, in GDPR about, so any logs that you have, uh, any analytics that you're running could be considered personally identifiable information and something you just need to be aware of. Um, psychometric data, I'll be honest, is a word I kind of had to look back up to make sure I understood it. Um, but anything, you know, uh, psychological data, if you have quizzes, surveys, um, personality traits were kind of the things that were listed on your sites, um, you know, could be, could be anything, learning records, um, considered psychometric. And inferences, so this is a, is a big one that's coming, more and more predictive analytics. If you're doing anything on your website to make a decision um, on what you should show that site visitor based on any of their information, that's predictive analytics and inferences that you're making, you have to be able to show that user how you're coming up with that inference and that predictive analytics according to this new um, California law, which most of us won't technically have to follow, right? But is still important and it coming, is coming. So security practices. There's just a great talk by Adam Warner downstairs on security practices, and I'm, I, again, it could spend forever, but I did want to highlight um, some of the, like, the quick things that, in case you missed his talk, or, or, or even if not, that we can just make sure that you have in place. So security goes very much hand in hand with data privacy. A big part of proving in all of these rules, or in, in, in all these laws and constructs that you're following best data privacy practices are that you have good security plan and good security management in place. Because if you can't protect the data that you're collecting, then it's kind of pointless. Um, so these are definitely on my checklist of something that every site from like the most, you know, sm smallest blog, brochure, small business website on up the chain. Uh, you got to choose a quality host. I'm not really going to recommend a specific host, but I think if they um, talk about WordPress a lot in our community and they're showing that they're part of the WordPress community, they're sponsoring WordCamps, they have managed WordPress services, that's a good place to start. Um, then you have to have a plan around your plugins, your themes, your WordPress core. And there's a lot we could talk about there. Um, so your making sure they're updated, first of all. WordPress core managed hosts are, are generally going to help take care of that for you. But these are, are things you definitely have to do um, in order to make sure that you're meeting kind of the minimal best security practices. Your plugins and themes updates, I know it's uh, frustrating. I run sites with lots of plugins, and I'm sick of every day like seeing notifications for updates constantly. And, and then also, you know, we need to test those updates you make backups, and it's, it's a big, long process, but the updates, if you know, if you dig into the change log, maybe you can put some updates off if it's not obviously a security update. If you read through and you see that it's definitely a security update, then that's one you um, don't want to waste wait, wait any time on. 
and, and same for themes, you know, where you get your theme, if you're building a theme, if it's built on a parent theme or something, um, you know, making sure that, that we're keeping those updated. And then also when it comes to plugins and themes, that's on the checklist, is that it's not really best practice to leave unused themes and unused plugins just laying around on your install. That's just a potential backdoor waiting to happen. Um, so you, if you're not using it, it's just good, good policy to just you know, delete it. You can always add it back later if you need it. Um, SSL certificate, that's, some way, that's one way that you can judge a quality host if they're offering <coughs> free SSL certificates in this day and age. Um, Google will penalize you or starting to penalize you uh, with, if you don't have an SSL certificate in place. And honestly, most, with most hosts, all hosts, they really should be free. I know some hosts will charge you more or make you be on a higher plan in order to have it, but uh, Cloudflare is a service that you can enable that offers um, some basic free SSL protection. There's Let's Encrypt. There's other ways that we can um, get SSL in place. So it definitely should be on your checklist, no matter what type of site. The, I guess the most basic log on up. Um, the next one is two-factor authentication. And this is really one that's kind of my personal soapbox and anyone that um, works at the company with me um, is probably frustrated by because we have implemented two-factor authentication on absolutely every single thing that we have, which we use lots of different services. So this isn't just your, your website. You need to enable two-factor authentication on your website. So what that is, in case you're not sure, you go to log in, you need to get a text message to approve or a code that you put in. Um, a lot of your banks will probably do things like show you a picture that you've pre-chosen. So these are just a, a second way of verifying your authenticity, uh, your authentication. So it's two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Definitely has to be in place. Not just on your website, on your email, on your social media accounts, and everything and absolutely everything that you can do. Um, and then find a good security plugin that you like. My company has a free one, Defender. There's, there's others out there for sure. Many will have a two-factor authentication piece built right in that will work with something. I think even Jetpack has a, a two-factor authentication thing. So if you install the Jetpack plugin, that's pretty popular. There's a, a module that you can enable to, to add two-factor to your sites. So uh, we'll get off that soapbox a little bit, but this is the, the quick one major security slide that we have here. So this is everyone's least favorite slide in practice and thing that we all have to do. And that's, we always have to start, and we need to do it pretty regularly, is a complete data audit of our site. And it's kind of annoying, it's not fun, and it's not really going to do something that obviously is going to increase traffic to your site, or revenue, or whatever it is, the goals that you have with your site. Um, but we need to look at all the ways we might be collecting data. List it. Write it down. Look at what those third-party services are that you're using. Um, so, like we use MailChimp a lot for email lists. That's an example that needs to go in my, you know, my complete data audit. I need to look at MailChimp's privacy policy, which, by the way, they do. They've done a great job of like all of the GDPR stuff and everything like that. That's why I like to use them as an example. Um, but you have, as part of the responsibility for to meeting a lot of these laws, you have to have documentation written down somewhere, it doesn't have to be too formal, I use just a Google Doc, and I list it, put the privacy policy, a date maybe the last time I kind of looked at it, um, we talk about what data specifically is being collected. So it used to be maybe that we would ask for a ton of things and store a ton of things in that MailChimp example, like names and cities and you know, all sorts of things. I think we've kind of gotten it down to maybe first name and email address because it's just easier that way. And we don't really need that all that other information. So there's use cases for all the extra stuff. But it's an example of where if you don't need um, data, you're not going to use it, then don't collect it. You're, you're minimizing your footprint. And that's really a big part of that privacy by design. Your CRM tools, your marketing. So these things are kind of external to your WordPress site but are probably part of your, your business or you know, whatever it is, your organization or whatever it is that, that you're doing and have a site for. If your site has contact forms, what contact form solution are you using? Where is that data stored? Is it in the WordPress database? What information are you asking? Do you need everything that you're asking? Do you actually use it? We used to, uh, 
include on our forms because we thought it would be useful to the support team, like all this stuff that you can collect, IP addresses and um, you know, what browser they're using and, and all that, but it's not really, it can be useful, but if we need it, we can just ask for it. So, and we want it to be more transparent to those people filling out the form that we were actually collecting that information, so we turn that off. That's a setting in a lot of the main um, like form plugins that are out there that you can append all of that information on. If you don't really need it and you're not asking the user, if, you're, if they're filling it out and you're not telling them that we're also sending as part of this email notification your IP address and your browser and all that stuff, then you need to not do that. Um, any analytics that you're using, Google Analytics, or it doesn't have to be Google Analytics, you know, there's ton heat tracking maps and all that sort of good stuff. Listing them out in your data audit, evaluating the tools that you're using, the services that you're using, what their privacy policies look like and their privacy practices look like, is part of what you kind of have to do this day and age if you have a site of any shape and size. And the most important, really, is uh, you know any payment transaction information. Uh, this is why we offload payments to the specialists um, that can. We're not actually keeping any credit card numbers in, in a WordPress database. You know, that's probably not a good idea. In general, WordPress was built, designed for public content to live live on the web, not to protect sensitive data. Um, so it's a good, there are plugins that will let us do anything and collect anything, but maybe that data is better housed in a service that was built specifically for that type of data and not WordPress. So you need to have a data minimization plan, and I kind of already talked about this, but how are you going to minimize your data footprint? If you don't need it, get rid of it. But part of the data minimization plan is how long are you keeping that data for? It used to be data, you know, storage cheap. We're going to keep everything forever. We may need it, but that's not the case anymore. Um, so if you don't need old contact information and uh, you know that people have sent through your forms, delete it. If you don't need your analytics longer than a month in the past, get rid of it, or, or whatever it is. Um, so you have to kind of decide for yourself what makes sense on your risk-based approach um, to determine what your, your personal data minimization plan is. A little caveat to that is there are laws and reasons why you do keep data long-term and forever, uh, especially financial transaction data, auditing, um, you know, the IRS comes calling or whatever, you need, you need transaction seven years, whatever it is in your state, or, or what type of business that you're running. You have the legal right, in fact, the legal responsibility to keep that sort of data. You just have to keep it in the, in the right place and in the right way, where people aren't going to find it and, and do whatever they want with it. And with all of these things, your, your plans and everything that I'm talking about, I'm going to be very repetitive about this. Write it down. Put it in writing, someplace safe for you, that you can access and you can show to someone should the worst happen in the future. You need a disaster recovery plan. Backups. You need a way to take backups. A good quality host will help you with this process and will be built in. It will be automated, nightly, weekly, whatever makes sense. Um, again, you probably don't need to keep these backups forever. Um, you know, determine a, a, a length of time that makes sense for you to have these backups. Some of you may, you know, uh, there are cases where you need backups for a specific period of time for you know, whatever legal obligations that you may have, like for student-generated data or something like that. But otherwise, seven days sounds pretty good to me. I'm not going to roll my, back, my site back up more than that in general for most average sites. Again, write that down. And then a, another thing to mention with your, your, your backup plan, uh, a lot of plugins that are out there for backups or services it's getting better and this is more rare, but kind of look out for, make sure that backup's not on the same server as your site, because it's kind of useless if, if like the worst happens. So it needs to be off somewhere else. Services that will upload it to Amazon S3 or you know, other services that are out there would be great. Oh, and I'll go back. With your disaster recovery plan, please test it. Like, you know, once a month, once every two months or something. Make sure that you can actually restore a site from a backup. It's kind of nice, because it's the worst when like you need to restore and your backup's corrupt or something. You need a breach notification plan. And again, write down your breach notification plan. 
GDPR, I believe it's 72 hours that you have to notify if you are aware of a breach. You have 72 hours. So you will see in almost all privacy policies, 48 hours written down. Um, it's rare that you'll see 72, but I think the law is 72. So that doesn't give you much time to notify users. And this is one of the things, if the worst does happen, and you're aware that your site was hacked and some email addresses, or worse, were exposed, you have the legal responsibility to notify those, those people that their data was potentially you know, uh, made available to someone else. You also have the legal responsibility, in most cases, to notify some authorities. In the US, it's a little bit less clear who those authorities are. Uh, outside of the US, there's data protection authorities that you must notify. Uh, we're almost done, and we'll do the questions. That's cool. Um, I know I told you to interrupt me, so I'm sorry. But um, I, what I do is I have, again, Google Docs, because I'm kind of a Google nerd. We have, for the worst, if the worst ever happens, I have templates that I've written of what these emails would look like. I do it for not just notifications like this, but like if sites are down or, or anything like this, they're very templated that we just copy and paste in. It just makes me feel better to have that as a backup. There are some, some notification examples and templates, definitely just a quick Google away of, of what people are sending. Um, so the people that might be responsible and the authorities definitely need to notify. Um, interesting, in the US, I believe it was Target, but don't quote me on that, that tried to get around notifying their customers because they were saying that it was an ongoing investigation and the authorities were telling them not to notify because that might hurt the investigation that was going on. Well, under the California law, I know for sure, and in others that are being written, that's no longer an excuse. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can't, you can't use that this is an ongoing investigation uh, excuse. So the big one, you have to publish a privacy policy. Good news is that there's a brand new WordPress tool came out right along with the GDPR where there is a template built into WordPress under, uh, I think it's under settings privacy, where you can edit and there's a whole list of text of almost an entire privacy policy for you. So if you're one of those folks that clapped your hands at the beginning that don't have one, you almost have one <coughs> in your WordPress site. And all of those things that I was talking about and asking you to write it down, the reason I was asking you to write it down is because you can simply copy and paste for the most part what you wrote down and put it into your privacy policy and the headings that are missing. So in the checklist that I have, it tells you what, what sections you kind of definitely need to fill out. Um, Automatic, the company behind WordPress.com and Jetpack and, and, and all those things, have a privacy policy that's published and all of their documentation is, is open sourced and, and, and useful. Um, so that's also something to check out for some language. Um, you know, with the GDPR and, and other, it's no longer good for your privacy policy to be legalese that nobody understands. It has to be written by, or understood by the non-lawyers. So that's why I felt like it was okay for me basically to write our new privacy policy, because I'm definitely not a lawyer, and uh, if I could understand it, I felt like we were, we were in the right direction. We were making a good faith uh, and due diligent effort there. Um, and so ours is, is inksub.com privacy policy there. There's probably flaws, so please tell me about them, um, but, but that's also something you're, you're welcome to use and help, you know, however helpful. Um, and then you got to get consent. Consent has to be opt-in. You can't have a checkbox that's already pre-selected. Someone has to, to check that box for consent. You can't just have one consent box for like everything at the beginning. You can't say, you're agreeing to terms of service, privacy policy, and this and this and that. It has to be broken up. Consent needs to be um, you know, by the individual thing that you're asking for and just in time at the time you're asking for it. So you don't get consent when they first visit your site for if they sign up later, or something like that. That makes sense. Um, and along with the new WordPress tools, there's a new data and deletion request built into WordPress core, released in early June, if I remember right. Um, so those are under tools. There's um, tools export personal data and tools erase personal data, where people can request a copy of everything that's in WordPress about them and request uh, that you erase it, and that is incredibly useful, and that was a lot of work by volunteers on the WordPress core privacy teams, and um, definitely check that out and play with it if you haven't yet. And then plugin developers. Plugins can hook into this 
to make whatever data those plugins are collected as part of that process. So when it first rolled out, it was basically just your comments and your posts, but more and more plugins are hooking into it. We're trying to hook into it with all of our stuff for sure. Um, the checklist that I talked about, there's a bit.ly link. I also tweeted it. Um, that's two pages, a Google Doc of everything I talked about with like check marks you can, as you go through with a little bit of information. That's a living document. There's a way for you to comment on it. It's, uh, it's, it's new, I haven't really used before. So if you have comments or questions there, that's a good place and we'll try to make that document more useful to more people. And all those puns that you saw were part of uh, all stolen. I stole right from our company's weekly or three times a week WordPress newsletter that's free and is full of puns. So I just put them in there because it kind of kept this boring topic maybe a little bit more interesting, I hope. And all the images were from our designers on our blog, um, from a WQB.blog. blog. And I think we have like nine-ish minutes for questions. Yes? So most websites don't collect much data. You right. know, you've got PayPal, you've got Aweber, you've got all those things. The one problem I see is membership sites. Mm -hmm. So if you get hacked, often your, your site is down. So is that something that you should be backing up, like that list of people, so that you can let them know they've been, you've been comfortable? Because that's really the only place, except for comments. Yeah, you can't get into it, right? You can't get into it now. So That would be part of, in your backups? And, and part of your breach notification plan, like how you can get access to your user base. And uh, you know, we keep a list of, of users outside of the WordPress database because that's really important for us to do. Um, so it depends, again, it's kind of on a risk-based, you know, how big the site is and how many there are. If you can export them all out and save them like in an encrypted way in a safe place, um, then do that because that's going to help you. If you take them out, then you've got to save them somewhere safe. Yeah, which is actually a funny like conundrum with the GDPR. If someone asks to be erased, mm -hmm. so you erase them, they no longer exist in all your stuff, but it turns out before they ask you to erase, you had a breach, you can't notify them. So they're kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, they shouldn't have asked to be erased, I guess, but um, that's just kind of an interesting <laughs> aside. Yes? Um, so I thought that's a really useful overview about like a lot of the core of GDPR and making the compliance effort with that. Do you have your slides available online? Yes, um, I have them. I just, on my top tweet is okay. there, and it's at Ronnie Burt. Awesome. And then I'll make sure that it's on my website, which is ronnieburt.com too. This is, this is great. I love to share it with my company. Yeah, no, please do. Yes. Another question. I'm, I build websites, and I have some people in Europe, so I, do, I know the GDPR, and I use CookieBot mm -hmm. for my consent. Mm -hmm. Are there any other tools that were sort of the best tool I could find? So I'm just looking if there's any other yeah. recommendations. I haven't done a lot of research into the whole cookie thing as much as I should, I'll be honest. Um, I have heard of CookieBot, and that's one I've looked at too, and I feel pretty good about it. Yeah. Um, so the question was, you know, about the whole cookie notification thing, which is sort of related to the GDPR and, and CookieBot you're using, and I've I played with it, but I don't know if I can totally, like, endorse it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Um, 
and, but, but no, appreciate it. No, and good point. So the, and I want to reiterate one thing because I, I might have misspoken too. The 72 hour rule for notification, just to make sure that it's on the live stream or on the recording, is not from when the breach happened, but it's when you were aware of the breach or anyone in your company is aware of the breach. In fact, that's part of the rules we had to talk about in the training piece that we, you have to train, and that's something that I didn't really mention, is uh, training your, anybody that's affiliated with your site, works in your company, everybody has to be trained on privacy, and part of it is they have to know who to notify and how. You know, as the organization gets larger, that becomes more complex, and it's when the first person in the organization is aware, that's when your clock starts ticking. Yes? Uh, okay, go ahead. Websites. So, um, in so, a lot of those sites just have simple contact forms on them. And so, just as a kind of a backup uh, for my clients, I've used I use Contact Form Seven mm -hmm. Bingo, and so I store the data in the database just because email isn't one hundred percent reliable. Right. Would I be best for those just to get rid of that? Is is that where we are with this? No, I. I think it depends on, on what you're collecting in the contact, and most people would tell you in the bottom of that contact form, you now need like a little box they can send into that says, please know that we're, we're going to store what you're sending us, and it will be emailed to someone. It seems like it should be obvious to someone submitting a contact form that someone's going to get that data, but you know we have to cover our bases. Um, and and kind of what I would say is, you know, this scares a lot of people into not wanting to do anything. You can do anything you want and collect anything you want if you get consent and, and you and you archive that consent um, and you document all that. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to answer, but I, I'm fine with keeping it in the database, but maybe as part of your like data retention policy, you go through and clean it out every, I know, I know that's a pain, but that's, that would be a good general practice. Thank you. Sure. So you spoke about how you need to get their opt-in consent when you use when they first get to your website. I'm thinking about things like Google Analytics, where I'm getting uh, for all users to my site, they all I find out their their geolocation on a lot of a lot of data. What happens if they don't accept and they opt out? I don't. I don't know if they opted out because they just don't click the opt in button, and I can't exclude them from my Google Analytics. It's because very much part of the cookie conundrum. The cookie yeah. consent yeah. shuts that down. So and you should use Cookie Bot. Okay. Nothing happens. That's the shield to your website. Gotcha. And all the boxes on mine. I have three boxes. Um, there's marketing. Analytics, non-preference, and, and meet, uh, you have to have. Like there's some things okay. you have to have. That's the shield. Nothing happens. So, they so can't I have to check. Your site? Yeah. No, they can't access the site. Okay. But they have to check. The boxes are all unchecked. You can't pre-check anything. So if I don't check analytics, mm -hmm. you don't get analytics. And, and, and so then there's a do not track that. So yeah. analytics makes it possible. Oh. To yeah. where then they will, it, the cookie won't be added and it won't be tracked. Yeah. Gotcha. So um, which analytics makes your analytics a little bit less yeah. useful. Yeah. Okay. Facebook pixels, you can shut them down. Yeah. You can okay. shut down all kinds of things. What was that called? Cookie, cookie bot. bot. Uh, is it a free service? And it's free if you have less than 100 pages. The trick to it is never have an attachment to your images. You know how sometimes when you, you go in and your images oh, are yeah. URL? Oh, yeah. You WordPress will create those extra pages. Yeah. yeah. You can plug in. You can put a plug in that strips that out. Okay. So we had a site that had hundreds of pictures of 10 pages. It was like, why is it coming on over 100 pages? It's because you haven't selected none for the attachment to the image. Okay. So that's just a trick. But CookieBot's free up to 100 pages. All right. Thank you. Sure. I think we might have a few seconds left if there's, if there's any more. Well, I'll definitely be around. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So this is not really website related, but mm -hmm. it's kind of digital lead generation related. If I am scraping the web and I'm grab, grabbing locations of businesses that I want to contact, the email address, the phone number and all that, is that a part of this process or not? It's a little beyond what I've looked into. Um, 
if it's public out there, you can scrape it. Google scrapes. We want Google to scrape our sites, right? But we don't want people that are going to contact us and nag us to scrape our site. So it's kind of a, <laughs> a different. I, I don't think there's a, you need to be safe with the data that you're collecting, but uh, no one's giving you consent to do that either, right? And so I don't, I don't know where really, honestly, where that falls in. That's interesting. It's interesting. All right. Last question. Somebody said to me that uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in a digital world with email marketing, just spend 50 cents on a new client, send them a message and make sure your last client says, I will follow up with you in a week and actually call them. It kind of brings the customer service back. But at least they're not going to hopefully ignore you if you can't write the whole thing out. Yeah. You know? And I think that's kind of a, because they have to opt in for the email, so you can't just send someone an email and expect them to respond and then you get free stamps. Yeah, and that, and that gets into more like the marketing email laws, which are related but not exactly the same as those. Well, if their email's on their website, they're inviting right. you to email, right? Yeah. So that's the conundrum, so, right? Yeah. It's always so fine line. But yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll be around the rest of the day tomorrow. Happy to chat about this stuff.